Mike Brady and his wife, that's me, uh, decided to change our lives radically and make service a foundation of nearly everything we do. The, since then, uh, Mike has found many organizations that could profit from his uh, dedicated focus and nearly tireless work. I say that knowing that most of you know exactly what that means. Rotary, Bead for Life, Prison Mindfulness Network, Restorative Justice, His Fraternity, and now an organization working to help orphans around the world called Frontier Horizons. He's always looking for ways to help, to serve, and increase the impact of nonprofits. It's always a service adventure with Mike, you have no idea. Today, he's here to talk about the impact of the war on orphan children in Ukraine. Please welcome to the stage, Mike Brady. Okay, you got my slides? Or is this it? This isn't it, isn't it? Okay, you, you pull up my slides. So the reason I was asked to speak today is about my perspective and work with orphans in Ukraine. Uh, I was in Poland two weeks after the invasion. Uh, I was in Ukraine last August, and tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. I get on a flight, and I'm going again for the next couple of weeks. Um, we're coming up on two years since Russia invaded Ukraine, and as is normal and very common, uh, other things uh, get our attention, uh, whether it's the Middle East, maybe it's uh, you know, potential conflict with, in Taiwan. Um, but you know, that being said, um, there's still a lot of suffering going on there in Ukraine, even if it's not in our, uh, in our news every day. So this was from three days ago. Okay, I screen printed it. Just because we might not see it on the TV news every day, the war is still going on in Ukraine. There's a lot of people who are suffering. And in my situation, uh, I'm focused on children that are within the border and those that we've evacuated outside of the country. But before I get into that, let me talk about how and why I got involved. Um, I'm an adopted kid with wonderful parents and a wonderful childhood. My older brother and sister are also adopted, and being adopted in my family is like no big deal. It's like finding out that you're Lutheran or Italian, okay? I mean, it's just no big deal. As a matter of fact, uh, there was no stigma. It, uh, it was like special that we were wanted and that we were loved. Um, so after many years of being on successful boards and many different organizations, about three years ago, I thought to myself, hey, I should give back to this area of my life, of whether it's foster organizations or adoption. And so I didn't know if that would be advocacy or counseling or working on a, on a board. So I put the word out on Facebook, and I probably got 100 responses, people with suggestions and various leads. And uh, my good friend Brian uh, said, Mike, I adopted my son about 10 years ago from Ukraine through an organization. I think you should check it out. And so that's what I did. Frontier Horizon is an uh, international hosting and adoption agency with programs in Nicaragua, Colombia, and Ukraine, with 80% of the children that we serve in Ukraine. Um, I like the people in the organization. Uh, I you know, went to a couple of board meetings, um, and my first uh, kind of commitment was the second week of February. I thought to myself, it's probably not going to take that much time. It's Ukraine. What's the worst that could happen? So two weeks later, on February 22nd, 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine. So that's about 23 months ago um, now, almost exactly. So um, Frontier Horizon has supported or, uh, orphanages in Odessa, in, in Ukraine, since the late 1990s. Um, in Odessa, which is in southern Ukraine, that is the re uh, at the bottom there, right there on the Black Sea, uh, circled in yellow, uh, we had five orphanages. So when Russia invaded uh, almost uh, two years ago, uh, we got those kids on a train. They kind of followed that path of the, to the left, the, the pink line to Lviv, 
and then we uh, got them the rest of the way over the border into, uh, into Poland um, to a place called Oso. The, uh, we also had a number of orphanages that we were working uh, with as, a, as an organization in Kiev. Those kids we got onto a buses, paid a huge premium, and we bust them all over uh, west across the border and into Germany. So today, uh, a lot of kids are there in Oso, Poland, um, about an hour and a half southwest of Warsaw, and other kids are in, uh, in Germany. They're in a big conference center. There's about 700 kids in Oso, um, and they're still there two years later. Okay. Here's, uh, here's one of the rooms. You can see all the mattresses on the floor there. Uh, here's uh, just some cute kids that I met. Uh, this was uh, two weeks after the invasion. At the time, we provided them with Galaxy tablets, extra shoes and clothing, and sports equipment to keep them occupied and healthy. Um, I always kind of joke with people that if you've ever had that dream that like, you know, someday I'd like to buy a bunch of uh, soccer balls and a bunch of toys and give it to kids, uh, to give it to orphans, I've lived that dream, okay? It's, it's pretty awesome. And uh, I got to play with these kids uh, when I was there. And this is in Oso, Poland. So we had hoped that the war would be, uh, would be brief and would uh, continue matching uh, the kids that are still within Ukraine with their parents. But when Russia invaded Ukraine, all adoptions were stopped. And these are... Um, this is particularly difficult because there were a lot of Americans who had gone over to Ukraine, bonded with the child, maybe had gone through 19 out of 20 checks, uh, you know, boxes, uh, you know, steps. The judge is about to sign it, and then they stopped. So these are parents who want the child, the child wants to be with them, and now they're separated, going on 23 months. These are people who uh, imagined that they would start their family with a child there in Ukraine, and they're no longer able to do that, at least right now. So within um, the border of Ukraine, we have a number of kids who uh, have guardians. So those that were evacuated are orphans in the more traditional sense. No guardian, no parents. They're in Poland and Germany. But some kids have a guardian. They might have lost their parents, but they have a family friend, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent. The government has said, you need to stay within the borders of Ukraine. So we thought to ourselves, they can't leave. They're having missiles and airstrikes all of the time. What can we do with these, uh, with these children? So if we can't get them out, we thought perhaps we can bring some humanity, humanity to them, and uh, even if it's only for a short time. So the answer was a one-week camp where they could get away from the stress of frequent missile attacks and air sirens and remember what it's like to be a kid in the mountains, uh, carefree, having fun. We hosted a stereotypical summer camp called Camp Say Yes in Bukovel, Ukraine, for 300 kids over three locations last August, and I was there to, uh, to assist. You're not allowed to fly commercially into Ukraine, which makes sense, because you don't want the air traffic controllers to mistake you for a military plane, all right? Safe for everybody. So I, fly, I flew into uh, Cluj, Napoca, Romania, and that's uh, the point of the uh, black arrow. And, uh, and then the blue line is the border between Romania and Ukraine. And I drove over the border to the red, to the red side. That's where Bukovel, Ukraine is. The kids are from Kiev, which is to the top right hand in the uh, circle, the purple circle up there. This is what the border crossing looks like. Uh, it was super easy. I don't know what else to say. Uh, no visa, no big hassle. Uh, you got out of your car, here you go, and you, you drove, across, uh, gr drove across the river. Uh, 300 children traveled from Kiev 
to where to Bukaval. So they were, um, and it was particularly difficult for them because the night that they were supposed to leave, there were two air raid warnings um, that, and so they had 300 kids, just imagine it, 300 kids in a train station, and they all had to go down into the tunnels, okay, twice, all right, and not lose any kids. I mean, those of you who are parents and grandparents, you know how difficult that must have been. But uh, eventually, they got on the overnight train, they went to, the, um, to, to Bukovel, and we greeted them. Uh, it was a couple miles from the train station to, uh, to where the camp was. So each of the kids has a, uh, has a story, a backstory, although many times we didn't know what it was. Uh, it wasn't a great way to start a conversation. Hey, tell me your backstory. What happened with your parents? Okay, we don't, We're not there to cause them trauma and to relive maybe a bad moment or a bad time in their life. Many of the camp counselors knew them already, worked with them in, in Kiev, and would share some of their stories with us, but it wasn't too often that they would do that. We were there to be in the present and uh, you know, to decompress for a week, and that's what we tried to do. Here are some of the kids uh, on the right-hand side playing with a soccer ball. You ever play where you know the, the ground is lava and you can't let the ball touch the bot right there? I'm right there. That's uh, the ball is about to hit my head. Uh, I know it wasn't a contest, but I was going to win. All right, that's all I'm saying. Uh, but uh, but that was a lot of fun. Uh, the top left is a uh, a pickleball. If you can recognize that. So uh, my good friend Kim, who I introduced, uh, Kim Wave. So, where are you, Kim? She's way back there. So uh, she brought a pickleball net and paddle and balls and everything you need. And I don't know if you've ever seen one of those things, but it's like, uh, like skis and like a golf clubs, you know, when you travel with it. Now, the way I remember it, I supported her the entire way. And I said, that's a great idea. No, I'm just totally joking. I pretty much made fun of her for bringing this big bag right up until it was the big hit. The kids absolutely loved it, and uh, it was such a great idea for her to bring that. So if there is a pickleball craze in Ukraine over the next 10 years, uh, that, that's, all of, uh, that's all of her fault. Um, so the kids went uh, to a, a park. We went hiking. We rode horses. Um, you know, we... We did a lot of things that you do at a camp. You do a lot of things where uh, kids who live in a city where there's planes flying over it, periodically a missile hits and a building that was, was there is no longer there, you get away into the mountains. And the mountains were beautiful. They're the Carpathian Mountains. Uh, they look not unlike some of our mountains, probably more like the Appalachian Mountains. And they're really quite beautiful, but they were able to get away into some fresh air. Um, I worked with, uh, we weren't really assigned to a group of kids. We were in, the kids were divided up into groups of 10. I worked with a bunch of six and seven year olds with, uh, with our good friend, uh, Nick. He's this uh, late 20s, early 30 year old um, guy who just liked kids. He's an aspiring actor, and right now, right now he's a primary school um, a teacher. So uh, that was. That was a lot of fun to get to see how many of the counselors interacted with the kids uh, and for us to also um, be there and interact with the kids. So um, what was amazing was the change from the first day to the last day. This was one week. They showed up tired, shy, um, not really knowing what's going on. And, you know, you've heard, many Boulder Rotarians have heard stories from RILA, uh, Rotary Youth Leadership Academy, uh, where the change that you see in just a week that's positive with other kids, it was sort of the same type of experience. By the end of the week, um, you can see my good friend Kim there saying, you know, waving to the kids. Uh, the kids were uh, much happier. They were talking. Um, you know, they were always saying hi, hello, and that was kind of the extent of their English. Uh, but it was, uh, for many of them, and uh, it was, it was a, amazing to see what they could, uh, a week of arts and activities uh, can do for the soul. I mean, you know, who knew? So 
Like any nonprofit or any event, uh, not everything went perfectly. Um, you know, 300 kids in three locations was way too many. Um, when I go next week, we're going to have 100 kids. Uh, 100 kids is going to be a lot easier. Uh, we can bond with them a little bit better. We can also control the environment. We can give them one-on-one -on -one, uh, attention. So we've made it a little bit smaller. Um, you know, the agenda was ever-changing. So uh, that's frustrating from a volunteer's point of view because I brought two of my friends. Kim was one of them and, and another friend. And, uh, you know, as volunteers, uh, when you're supposed to be on the bus at 9 o'clock, and it's 1030 and you're finally getting on, you know, as a Westerner, we're used to Western style efficiency. And when you go to other countries, come to find out they're not on the same system. All right. And so an hour at the park in the sun is actually four hours in the park, you know, with no water for the kids. So there are a lot of things that, um, that we want to improve upon. And I say that not to shame ourselves, but to inform our future actions. And I think that's really important. So one of my main goals this next week, so I'm leaving tomorrow morning, okay, and I'll be there this next week, um, is to ensure that uh, those things that we identified in August are fixed this next time around. Because we want it to be a good experience for the children. We also want it to be a good experience for any volunteers that would like to come and be a part and try to help out some kids that are in need. Um, so once, um, so once the kids were, uh, once the week was over, we uh, put them back to the train, they got on, they went back to Kiev and they went back to their, uh, to their guardians. Um, now my friends, uh, as I mentioned, they said it was life changing, a life changing experience. And I would, um, I would offer to you, even though I haven't asked her, go ask Kim, uh, after the, after the lunch, uh, what her experience was like. But going out there, being outside of your comfort zone, uh, being flexible, figuring things out as you go, you've got to be real flexible. Uh, you know, it was a life-changing experience. Um, so Ukraine had every reason to stop adoptions, uh, international adoptions, when Russia invaded, as I view the world. They're worried about their young citizens. They don't want to have them trafficked in any way. So whether they're in Poland or Germany or whether or not they're within the borders, they've got to have some control so that bad things don't happen in all the chaos that war is. Frustratingly, 23 months later, international adoptions are still not allowed. Uh, domestic adoptions have now been uh, available, so Ukrainians adopting other Ukrainians since last spring. But international adoptions uh, are still not uh, uh, permissible. Uh, Representative uh, Chris Smith out of New Jersey has proposed House Resolution 915, a bipartisan request for Ukraine to open up uh, international adoptions again. It's not very controversial. I've read the text. Hey, could you have international adoptions again? I mean, how, how is this controversial? Uh, so if you're looking for something that you could do immediately. I know many of you are friends with our congressman, Joe Neguse. Get him to be a co-sponsor. Uh, you can go to frontierhorizon.org and on that, at the, kind of at the bottom, there's a big button that says, how can I contact my congressman about this particular resolution? Um, it's, you can find, if, you, if Joe isn't your, your congressman, uh, you can find who your representative is. There's a template there. You can cut and paste it right into an email, and away you go. Now, many of you have asked um, why I get involved in something like this. And um, I believe that there are things that you can control and things that you can't control. I mean, I love being a part and voting in our uh, representative government of the United States, but I also like to get involved in very tangible activities where I can see the output. Um, my experience has been that when there's big events or big, big problems, it doesn't matter what it is, people get paralysis of analysis. They're not really quite sure where to go, what to do. And so um, I spend most of my time just trying to find one thing and make a difference. And uh, that, I have to just kind of hope and trust that other people are gonna fill it up with some of the other things that need to be done. If I allow myself to be stuck, 
then I'm doing nothing. And I know that that's probably not, not the way to go. So, um, so my advice is to find something that you're passionate about, um, do the best that you can, and be relentless in the pursuit of that passion. Um, many obstacles, many frustrations along the way, but um, you know, just keep the result in mind. Uh, don't get frustrated, uh, but get involved. That's it, I'll take any questions. So I'm curious where you're going to take 100 kids in the dead of winter. And a comment about the adoptions. It could be that one of the reasons they're not interested in having international adoptions is they don't want to lose the younger generation. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Thank you. Uh, so we're not going to Bukovel. We're going to a place just a little bit south and west. I actually don't remember the name of the town. I haven't been there yet. so it's. Looks all foreign name to me. I can't remember it. Um, it's going to be at, a, at, a, at a, another kind of hotel camp type of thing. It is safe, um, so that's what's really nice. Uh, you can fit 100 kids. I mean, the kids are like three, four in a room. You know, they don't get their own rooms. So uh, we have no problems. Um, so that's the answer to your first question. Um, the second is, uh, yeah, I get that. You know, th there is that. Um, it, uh, many of the, I could see that maybe with new kids, but those that are already through the process who've been identified, I would sure hope that um, they could open it up again so that the, the kids who have a bond. One of the problems is, um, is a lot of the kids uh, had a bond with a parent, they went through the process, they might be 13 or 14 years old, which is a very hard age to find, and they're gonna age out of the program. They're gonna be 16, 17, 18 years old, okay? So that's a, that's a real problem too, is people just aging out or not being interested anymore. Um, so I hear that argument, and that's a, that's a, um, that might be their thinking. Um, I'm also pretty cynical. Do I have to go? Okay. Um, but, but before um, the next question, uh, folks wanted to let you know that Melanie is online. Yes, okay. and listening, so I thought you might want to recognize her. I should have done that. Thank you very much. Uh, Melanie is our uh, interim CEO for the uh, organization. Uh, Melanie is exactly one of those people who she has two boys in Germany that she and her husband um, were very close to completing the adoption. Now they're in Germany, and uh, they would go to Germany and visit them. Um, now they're not even allowing many of the parents to even interact with the kids, which is really frustrating, or in person. I think they can do it phone or, or video. So, uh, yeah, I had ahead. a question. How did you deal with the language issue? Do, they, do the kids speak English? Um, how were you able to interact? Yeah, the, the children learn English around uh, age 11 or 12, something like that. So if they were 11 or 12 or older, they would have passable English. Those younger, they Great. clueless. Uh, we did have a number of uh, translators. Many of the counselors, since they're over, you know, they're over 20 years old, uh, they would translate for us. Uh, also, Google Translate is unbelievable. It is free, it's on your phone, and you just talk into it, it recognizes it, and then it translates it uh, in words and in spoken to them. The kid starts talking to it, it waits a second, and then speaks English to you. So we had full conversations back and forth talking into my phone for free. How do you like that price? I mean, it's unbelievable. Really quite remarkable. Um, well, first of all, thanks for all your great work uh, helping Ukraine. Um, also, you mentioned paralysis of analysis, and personally, I don't have paralysis of analysis when it comes to Ukraine. I rage donate. Um, the war is so horrific and unjust, and when I get angry, I donate to an organization doing good work in Ukraine. So, don't have paralysis analysis, rage donate. All right, thank you. I'm the treasurer, we need the money. <laughs> Uh, do we have any more questions in the room? Oh. 
Uh, hey, Mike, quick question. It seems to me the Russians have been unbelievably obnoxious on where they send bombs and drones. How uh, is, this, is the camp safe? That yeah. would seem like a big target. And how do you keep it safe? Yeah, it is safe, is the short answer. As a matter of fact, um, uh, where we were in Bukovao, about 150 miles north of there is Lviv. Um, there were some uh, missile, like a, a day or two before we showed up um, last August, but there was never anything. As a matter of fact, I would, um, uh, we're, we're pretty far southwest is my point. You know, we're not really in, they got problems in the east and in the central, but where we are, it's, it was fine. Uh, the town that we were in, Bukovel, was very similar to like Breckenridge or Vale, frankly. Uh, it was safe. Yeah, you, you could have told me that I was in, Va uh, in, um, in Vale, and I would have believed you. Now, we were outside of that town, but when you went into the town, it was very much like a ski town uh, in the areas in the Carpathian Mountains. So uh, could something happen while there? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, but let's, let's hope not. I mean, they, once again, they, they're, it's pretty focused on the central and the east, and we're in the southwest. Great. We have time for one last question. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. This, uh, thank you for the presentation. This work is amazing, and I really commend you on that. It's really beautiful, um, first of all. And uh, I was wondering, what is, like, I'm sure these kids have been through some, you know, some tough times, and were there certain things that uh, were helpful for them um, at the camp uh, for coping? Was it just the activities that was the best part? Or were they able to um, come together and talk about their experiences, um, maybe within a group, and uh, be able to sort of um, sympathize with each other, empathize? Uh, was that helpful for them? Yes. So. Um you're asking a very good question. I'm actually going to go a little bit to my lifeline. D did they, I don't believe that they really had like, when, you, when I hear the second half of your question, I think of like group therapy. You sit there and you talk and you process and things like that. I don't actually think that there was that. And if it was, I wasn't a part of it. Just to be, so I don't think that that happened. It really was more of how can we get these kids with the traditional activities and camp and arts, running around. Uh, some of the things, I mean, it's, uh, those of you who are, uh, are either teachers or not, you, there's a lot of on the fly. And so they had like some concerts where the, they had a, um, you know, the, with the big um, music speakers and they're doing karaoke and they came up with uh, various uh, dance moves and stuff like that. So there's a lot of that in order to feel, um, but I don't believe that. Kim, are you aware of any kind of group discussion Well, uh, why don't we uh, wait a second, Kim? Sorry. I know we're short on time, so I'll try and make this quick. But um, I was also part of the group that, that worked with what we're, we called the littles, which were the kids under nine. And... Um, very, very impromptu. This happened one afternoon with their counselor, who was, um, his name is Nick. He has his pet cat that he gets off the train with his pet cat on his shoulders. This guy is absolutely amazing. All of our favorites, and I'm, I'm so jealous that Mike is going to get to see and spend some more time with Nick next week. But a very impromptu session with the littles, of all things, these kids under the age of eight, where they started to sit down, and Nick was so surprised, and started to speak about their experiences with each other. And just how tragic that comes across in the words of a six, seven, and eight-year-old. And Nick was just, he was, he was stymied by it. You know, didn't really know what to do with all of that. It wasn't something that he particularly brought up, but it just came, it started to come out. These kids needed and wanted, and they started talking with each other. It happened pretty late in our visit, by the time they'd known each other and, and spent a, quite a bit of time with each other. But I do think that those things happen. They happen organically. I made very good friends with another teenage girl. Her picture was up there earlier. She had come from a very, very tragic experience. 
of she and her parents and her grandmother were all having tea one day. They ran out of tea. She and her grandmother go across the street to get tea. In the meantime, a missile came, and she watched her parents die. So she was at camp. She really didn't want to be at camp. She was very clear about that. She really wanted to be at home with her grandmother. But what she needed to was, was to hang out with an adult. Okay, she didn't really want to be with the kids. She wanted the safety and security of being with an adult. And Google Translate, as Mike said, the kids really weren't allowed to have, I mean, only a few of them had phones, but they weren't allowed to have them during the day. We as adults, once we figured out the Google Translate thing, and once more importantly, the kids figured out the Google Translate thing. They taught us, or they taught me anyway. And we're walking around with our phones having perfectly wonderful conversations and interactions with kids through the phone. It was just, it, it was absolutely life-changing for me. Mike, thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Um, you know that we're going to donate 100 doses of polio. We'll present uh, for in, 100 in, doses. In, in, That's in, right. It's my price. In, in your honor. Um, but I thought since polio has been the most important project that Rotary is engaged in uh, <clears throat> since its founding, probably, uh, I thought I would ask a few quick questions. And I know we're short on time, so I'll make them really quick. Um, all right, average cost to protect a child, $2, $3, $4, or $5? Anybody, $2, $3, $4, or $5? $3, sorry, $3. Um, how much has Rotary contributed to polio eradication since the first project in the Philippines in 1979? $1 to $2? billion dollars, two to three billion dollars, three to four billion dollars, four to five billion dollars. Two to three. Two point one billion dollars has been contributed just by Rotary. Okay, last one. How much does worldwide monitoring cost per year? A lot of us think polio, we always say it's this close and, and as Carl has talked about, a lot of the funding has slowed down. Uh, how much does it cost per year for worldwide, uh, for worldwide monitoring? 10 million, 50 million, 100 million, or $250 million? And yet, $100 million per year. So it's important that we continue to contribute. Thanks again, Mike. 100 doses are going for the kids. Grab your calendars now or your phone or just remember, April 8th, Monday, is the next Boulder Rotary Club book club. Together, the healing power of human connection in a sometimes lonely world hosted by Sue Deeds. Put it down right now. Somehow get there. April 8th, Monday, Boulder Rotary Club book club. It's not too early to mark your calendar for the 2024 District 5450 Conference. Join Rotarians from 57 clubs in our district on Saturday, September 28, 2024 at the Colorado State University Spur Hydro Building in Denver. The focus of the program will be on Rotary's newest area of focus, the environment. Learn what Rotarians are doing on topics like sustainable living and agriculture, Rotary Firewise, Operation Pollination, and Pollution and Plastic Waste. Save the date, Saturday, September 28, 2024. <laughs>
Colorado has three voting cycles in 2024. As voters, we're lucky Colorado has many voting innovations and wide voter accessibility, due in part to current Secretary of State Jenna Griswold. Secretary Griswold is the youngest Secretary of State in the U.S. and has been busy since being elected the first time in 2018. A few of the election improvements she and her office have been working on, ballot tracking, increased ballot drop boxes, automatic voter registration, increasing security from cyber attacks and foreign interference, guaranteeing drop boxes and voting centers on college campuses and tribal lands. Next week, Secretary Griswold will speak to Boulder Rotary about election security. We hope you can be here for this interesting and timely program. Invite friends and colleagues and make sure to RSVP with Vanessa so we can guarantee you a seat. Listen up, the ratings just came in for last month. We are number one. We just grabbed every key demographic. Super yeah. duper, gang. Yeah. Super duper. That's nice. Way to go. Neat O, gang. Yes. Boy. Oh. Yeah. That is good news. Yeah. I'll be honest. Congrats. That Congrats. is good news. Hey, amigos. Let's have, have a great, great weekend. weekend.